From the Wall Street-led market crash of 2008 to carmaker Volkswagen engineering ways to manipulate emissions test results, to a pharmaceutical company raising the price of an AIDS drug by more than $700, the reputation of some big businesses is suffering, and rightly so. Why are companies making such bad moral choices? Maybe because the students they hire out of MBA programs have been taught to make those bad decisions? Let's find out. Joining us now, two professors who do their best to teach ethics to business students. Anne Armstrong is here. She's a lecturer and director of the Social Enterprise Initiative at the U of T's Rotman School of Management. And Mike Valenti is here. He's associate professor of organization studies and associate director of the Schulich School of Business International MBA program at York University. We have no time left for the discussion because your titles are both so long. <laughs> Anyway, great to have you both here. First time on this program, and Mike, your first time on television ever. Yes. Fantastic. We're glad you are uh, no longer going to be a rookie after today with us. Happy to be here. Let me read this and get us started here. The sheer brazenness and conniving that went into Volkswagen's actions are probably what shocked people the most. This was a highly technical and sophisticated operation that basically taught the emission system how to distinguish between road travel, typical idling, and idling while undergoing an emissions test. No spin can mitigate that fact. There is and can be no claims of confusion or misunderstanding, no failures to communicate. This will erode people's trust in Volkswagen as a company to a degree that the failures of other companies may not have experienced. In the Volkswagen scandal, just like the story about price gouging in pharmaceuticals that broke the same week, consumers are confronted with the stark reality of corporate malfeasance. Let's start to unpack this. And when you first heard the VW story, that they actually programmed the cars to cheat the emissions tests, what would you think? Well, I wasn't particularly surprised. I think I probably have a rather jaded views, a view of corporations. But as I learned more about it, the degree of, as it were, sophistication in trying to lie and successfully lying, that got my attention because there was obviously a lot of people involved doing a lot of thinking about how to beat the tests. I'm surprised that you weren't surprised. Why were you not surprised? Well, I, uh, I mean, so many corporations do things perhaps not quite of that degree of sophistication. The person who upped the price on the AIDS drug, that staggered me because it was so in your face. It was like, I don't really care what you think. Whereas the Volkswagen one perhaps was a less surprising because I would expect other companies might do that too. Hmm. Mike, your reaction when you heard? Yeah, I was just more of a, okay, there's another one sort of thing. So not, not a huge surprise. I mean, it was particularly egregious in, in nature, but we have a number of these examples of, of companies engaging in this either very immoral or illegal and immoral behavior. So this is just another one that uh, is getting some attention. Um, there's a lot of sophistication behind it, no doubt. Um, but you know, I think of other similar sorts of scenarios where companies have undergone this sort of behavior. So not a huge surprise, just really disappointed. If, if the right. VW one, okay, disappointed and not surprised. Uh, is there another example that comes to mind for you of a company whose behavior was particularly egregious, maybe even more so than VW's? Definitely. I, I think with VW, we, we do get, it, it's, it's easier to understand what's going on. I mean, they're cheating and they're remitting way more than they are actually, are uh, much more than they're saying they are, what mm -hmm. their, their tests are showing. But I think another one would be uh, the LIBOR uh, scandal. So the, the deliberate manipulation of the exchanges in the UK and beyond by Barclays and a number of other, other companies. That to me is, is, you know, the environment is huge, it's very important, it's very long term, but these are, these are, are, are initiatives that are, are deliberately changing interest rates. They're affecting millions and millions and millions of people. So when I think of another example that goes to that level, I think of, I think of the, the banks and a lot of them now sued billions of dollars for, for engaging that behavior. And I presume they do this because they think they're not going to get caught. I assume so. That, I assume that too. And is that in fact the case that more of this goes on than we know of and they don't get caught and therefore it's a rational decision to cheat? Yeah, I guess that probably more does go on, but I don't have data at the center of my fingertips to say, but it would not surprise me. But I think absolutely, it's everything is fine until you're caught. And then it's awkward when you're caught because then you actually have to fess up or at least if not fess up, figure out ways to explain away the damage that you did uh, and say, you know, we didn't mean it or it isn't as bad or uh, you misunderstand or it's your fault. But I think we see a lot of that. Uh, but I think absolutely, if an organization could 
get away with something that is immoral, illegal, inappropriate, and they're not caught? For them, yes, probably a rational decision. VW shares are off about a third, more than a third, since this broke. How big a smackdown is that for the company in your view? Pretty significant. The other thing that I didn't really appreciate until I was reading a little bit about it is the kind of emotional attachment consumers have to, they were talking about how they felt betrayed because they thought back to their first Beetle and so on. <laughs> so I think that in addition to the kind of monetary uh, response to the stock market, I think people feel personally somehow violated that VW, that they that hurt them in a very kind of fundamental way. And I had <laughs> underestimated that. I mean, we appreciate the market effects. We appreciate the environmental damage, but people are hurt. There's an emotional yes, connection very. that's been broken yeah, here. Yeah. They've been doing this for seven years, VW. Uh, get us into the head of the ethics of corporate executives who think that they can get away with doing something like this for so long. What makes them think they can? Um, I think the length of time, there's a, an escalating commitment factor here where when you read about it, there's, there's a, lot of, a lot riding on, on the success of this vehicle. The, the, you know, the idea that it's a small diesel uh, vehicle. We're, we're doing something that no competitor can do. Millions and millions of dollars, lots of effort over years to make this happen. And then 2007, the regulations start to increase. Mm -hmm. Oh, no, we're not going to be able to meet them. We've invested so much, so we've committed so much, so it's difficult for us to back down. Um, but underlying all of that is definitely going to be this cost-benefit analysis of, okay, we could get caught, but the benefits of not getting caught are huge because we'll be the differentiator in, in this market. And so that's part of it, is thinking strategically on, you know, what, there, is a there is a potential risk of getting caught, but the benefits far outweigh what those risks might be. Well, I wonder if part of the cost-benefit analysis is also just what Anne referred to there. We're Volkswagen. People have loved us for decades. We'll be able to weather the storm. Do you think that's part of it? Um, yeah, I think so. Uh, I mean, I think you need to kind of step back and, and, and consider the fact that um, the dominant ideology in business is going to be the maximization of shareholder wealth, right? So when, when you're looking at that very narrow mindset as an objective, um, you're, you're going to be f thinking about ways in which you can achieve that, even if it, it constitutes breaking the law um, and, and with the hope that you won't get caught. So I'm not sure if you could say it's Volkswagen specifically or just, just an ideology that pervades companies, Volkswagen being one of them, um, that derails them in this direction that they would, they're doing things they otherwise wouldn't do. And can I get your view on the ethics of a former hedge fund manager in the U.S. buying the rights to an AIDS drug and then suddenly jacking up the price to over $700 a pill? As I said earlier, that was the one that really did shock me because it was, as uh, your earlier comment suggested, it was brazen. And it, it was interesting when you read what he said. It was basically, hey, it's mine. I can do whatever I want with it. That is true, though, isn't yes. it? Yes. But on the other hand, I think he learned something. Well, perhaps he didn't learn something. <laughs> he backed down because I think there was a limit to how much kind of brazen behavior uh, even people who are interested in maximizing profit were prepared to tolerate. Because that was so in your face. And he did have to back down. But he still, of course, technically can do whatever he wants. And I think, though, the pushback, and we're talking about AIDS drug, we're talking about a medicine that can help the most vulnerable who have a very difficult disease. And to be that brazen mm -hmm. in that space raises the question of what on earth do you do in other domains that are not quite so uh, related to kind of our ability to function in a healthy way as mm -hmm. the AIDS drug. Let me read another excerpt from Edward Queen, this from The Conversation. Uh, he writes, for the past five to six decades, epigones of Milton Friedman have been emphasizing that the only duty of a corporation is return on investment, regularly ignoring his caveat of doing so within the law and social norms. This lesson, drilled into generations of business school graduates, now drives tsunamis of corporate malfeasance. Data regularly demonstrate that business school students are more likely to cheat on examinations and assignments than their peers, although, and this is of interest for the Volkswagen case, they are closely followed by engineering <laughs> students. Yeah. Yeah. Let's get into some discussion here about the people who are emerging from the schools that you two work at and whether, not necessarily you specifically, but you generally are helping to change the ethics of the people who are going to be running the companies of this country and around the world for generations to come. Uh, 
First of all, the cheating and all of this stuff that goes on. Any of this surprise you? Uh, I know it disappoints you. It does. Uh, yeah, I guess I guess it does because it's it's getting to uh, a question of you know is it does it mean that um, business schools are attracting the type of person who is who is a cheater uh, more so than others or is it um, all the students are the same as the inter university but the business school um, turns them evil? What let's is say. it? Yeah, okay. So, so it's hard it's hard to say. I, I think. Um, I think there is a competitive environment in the business school that perhaps uh, could facilitate um, a, a high level of, of you know, behavior that perhaps is much less ethical. Um, I think their engineering would be another one as well where it could be quite intense. Uh, there could be other professional schools also. So I don't think that helps. Um, but I think it, it could also be the type of person who's attracted to a program, could, could be a certain personality that perhaps would be OK with, with a certain sort of cheating than, than another person who's interested in another program. So I think it's a bit of both. And how about you on that? The I think actually, uh, I agree with a lot of what Mike has said. I think the thing that strikes me as particularly a professor who spends a lot of time teaching undergraduates is the extraordinary pressure and stress they're under. So I don't know whether they come with, as it were, I'll cheat to get through, or because of the pressures they feel and they look around and think, oh, it's a dog eat dog world well, out who there. Who puts the pressure on them? Uh, some, I think themselves and their parents. And How about you, the profs? I don't, but then um, I think my students think I'm a little, a tad unplugged. But uh, <laughs> I don't, because I'm very conscious of, I watch students who are clearly suffering. And if they're stressed, they're not going to do well. That doesn't mean they are going to be relaxed but to do well, but they are under this really fierce pressure. They have to get a job. They have to satisfy their parents. And if that means I take you down to do that, so be it. There, there's a, um, I mean, on the one hand, we want them to be competitive. We want them to feel a certain amount of pressure because some people really, you know, the cream rises to the top when they're under a bit of pressure. Presumably, there's a point at which, though, too much pressure turns them to the dark side of the force. Mm -hmm. Is that fair to say? Yeah, I, th I think so. Um, I think another thing we haven't talked about is, is the, uh, the job market um, not being as, as favorable in the last uh, mm -hmm. little while. So I think it... When, when you have employers looking at grades, which in some sectors they do, um, you, you have, you know, who's, who's going to get ahead to get the job? And so um, that pushes them beyond the idea of just being fun competitive and, and trying to, to, to be effective through co competition. It says, how can I, what other ways can I, can I achieve this level of rising to the top? Well, and, Edward and Queen goes on to say in his piece that, that when this ethical dilemma exists, that, you know, if, if, I'm not going to make it if I don't cheat. 20 to 30 percent of the students don't even see this as a dilemma. Mm -hmm. It's just full speed ahead. Mm -hmm. I mean, do you see that in your daily well, classroom life? Well, it was interesting because I explained to my undergraduates yesterday, I teach a course on corporate social responsibility and environmental responsibility as well. And so I said I was coming here and I wanted to get their sense of what what their views were. And I really thought the first person who spoke, I thought he was the clone of Milton Friedman. And he said, look, it's, you know, it's the market, and we'll do what it takes to get ahead. And he also went on to say that uh, he simply couldn't understand why uh, we were even discussing the issue of ethics in the workplace. Mm -hmm. And so I thought it was perfect. It was exhibit A, and uh, <laughs> then other students uh, chimed in. But the ones who were quiet, I wished I had been able to extract ideas, because I think they were uncomfortable with this absolute undiluted uh, sort of Friedman approach. So, But being good Canadians, they weren't about to challenge somebody in public. Absolutely correct. And they didn't, you mm -hmm. know, they didn't say sorry even. You know, they were, it was awesome. So, you should send the name of that first student who reacted yeah. to Volkswagen, because maybe that's a CEO of the future for that <laughs> Absolutely. company. Absolutely. I'll tease them next week. Good idea. Well, the obvious question then becomes, what are you and you yeah. and your schools, and obviously there are many across the province of Ontario doing, to try to inculcate a higher sense of ethical behavior among the people who are going to be running the businesses of the future? Fire away, Mike. What are you doing? Um, well, I think a lot of business schools around the world are, are incorporating um, courses that are mandatory in business ethics and corporate social responsibility and sustainability. There's an increasing number of electives um, that students can take. Um, some business schools have uh, centers of, of ethics, so they're trying to allocate a number of resources to, to push for research in this area to make it a bit of a hub in the business school. Um, 
I think, I think though, what it, it's missing, though, is that by departmentalizing it, you still have this uh, core um, ideology and offering to students that's shareholder wealth maximization. Then they come to us in their third or fourth year and they say, and they're, they're really surprised by our course because they don't understand why we would move away from all we have to do is maximize shareholder wealth. Why are we doing this extra stuff? And so by departmentalizing it in the business school, um, you sometimes tend to lead to this situation where the core courses, your finance, marketing, and accounting, yeah. say, well, we don't need to really look at that anymore. We can go back to basics because Mike and Anne are gonna cover that in, in their course. And so now imagine the mentality of the student where the foundational course is, is shareholder wealth maximization, and then you got this perhaps perceived fluff, as we talked about yeah. it, that, oh, we're just kind of mm -hmm. making sure we know there are some issues. But if it's not brought in to your, your core finance prof saying there are major ethical issues we need to incorporate into our financial decision making, it's really not going to get the change that you need. So I think we're, we're hopefully heading in that direction. I think the first step is, is departmentalize it, put resources to it. It's easier. But when you've got to start integrating it into all the core courses, that's organizational change. That, that, that's a little more resistance associated with that. And can you tell whether or not the students who are going to your classes are there because they deeply believe in the message of corporate social responsibility, or are they there because they know they got to be there and they'll just sort of get through it, but really shareholder maximization is where their focus is. No, I'm actually pretty lucky because my course is an elective, so people have chosen for whatever reason to be there. Mm -hmm. And what I try to do is two things. One, get them to understand their own values better. And mm -hmm. also, two, to look beyond the propaganda uh, that an organization might say, oh, we're really a good corporate citizen, but then we look a little bit more deeply and find actually, we were talking about blood bananas yesterday, Chiquita, mm -hmm. that they actually pay uh, gorillas, thugs, uh, to, for protection, so it's extortion. So we're thinking about what to do then, and what is the, the dilemma? How would you handle the dilemma of providing a, a product that's wanted around the world mm -hmm. and having this sort of sidebar activity that is, quote, protecting your employees, but is illegal in the United States and a few other places? So. I try to kind of get people to see beyond the fluff because I don't think they don't see my course as fluff, but they choose to be there. If I was forcing them to be there, for sure they would Maybe. see it as fluff. Hmm. How much of this, I don't know if this is knowable because it, it requires a knowledge of the backgrounds of, of your students that you may or may not have. How much of this is bad parenting, Mike? How much of this is you get kids coming to you and their parents have actually not taught them that they need to be ethical people even before they walk into the doors of the business school. Uh, yeah, I, I can't. It's hard to say. I mean, I, I think, um, you know, do, do we, that, that begs a broader question of do we have a, are we ins ensuring our students have a moral compass as they, as they enter university? Are we challenging them with, with moral questions early enough? Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't feel I could respond to that, but when, when I see the students coming in um, to the program, um, I, I think that there is a bit of, of, of a gap in terms of, of how do I even identify what is an ethical issue, how do I you know, collect information that can help me make a decision on, 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 uh, based on my values and what should, but I, it's, it's a hard question to answer. Okay, and let me give you the last word on this then. Can you actually teach ethics? Well, I think so. Not necessarily that you can look at someone, say, Conrad Black, and say, oh, he was a very bad person when he did this and this and this. I don't think that's a helpful approach. I think it's much more helpful to help the students articulate their values. And most of us don't think about it, never mind students, most of us don't think about this every single day. And I use a very simple tool where I ask people to write what they think their values are, and they find it very hard, and they're looking at me like, what kind of prof are you? And then I ask them to talk about two instances where they lived up to their values, two instances where they failed, they let themselves down. Mm. And so interesting, they talk at great length about the latter and are very embarrassed about the former. And they're honest about it. Uh, well, I've had people say, you promise you won't say this, you know, tell yeah. anybody. And it's the, the positive part they were concerned I might be indiscreet about, which isn't <laughs> kind of what I predicted. <laughs> but at the end of the exercise, what I'm really hoping is not that I'm teaching them ethics, but I'm helping them articulate their ethical values and matching their behavior against or in conjunction with uh, their uh, values. And at the end, I ask them a question, which is, okay, so you did this task, it's a paper, you're stuck doing it, but what did you learn from doing it? Mm -hmm. And they're pretty discombobulated, and I'm really glad about that, because then at least somebody said to them, think about what you stand for, 
if anything. And it turns out, actually, uh, they stand for more than you might give them credit for on first blush. Good. Thanks, you two. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Ann Armstrong from the Rotman School of Management. Mike Valente from the Schulich School of Business. Great to have you both here at TVO tonight. Thanks, thank you Steve. very much. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit supporttvo.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.